Okay. So. I am guessing that he reboot was in order. That, that happened. Like, temperature has gone down. But yeah, like, thank you for your patience because I did not reboot my laptop this morning. I am curious as to whether that was the cause, but we'll find out soon enough. Let us continue. Okay, so let's see if that helps. All right, holding strong. We're good. We are good so far. I spoke too soon. But we're going to power through it and see what happens. I whirl around, clutching the thick roll of clean bandages. I try to step back from him, but my legs bump against the edge of the cot. Your caution is understandable. Though if I meant you any harm, you would know. That doesn't make me feel better in the slightest, but he makes no move towards me, so I quickly wind the bandages around my hands. The glowing scars and mottled skin disappear under a layer of clean, like, queen, clean white cotton. May I ask why you need additional bandages? I clench my jaw. I knew it would only be a matter of time before he asked about my hands, though the way he does it is strangely roundabout. Uh... Well, that's a very personal question, and I really don't want to answer. That's so. Surely you realize that I can only help you if you tell me what ails you. <laughs> oh, an involuntary snort of laughter escapes me. Where would I even begin? Would he even believe me if I told him? No. Best to keep my curse to myself for now and learn more about him first. Who are you? You may call me Kuras. And where exactly am I? Iridia, which I assume was your caravan's destination. I can think of nowhere else for a group of travelers to go. Iridia? So I made it to the City of Knowledge after all. I, I should feel relieved, but all I can manage is a vague sense of increasing unease. How did I end up here? I brought you to my clinic, of course. You were the only survivor from the caravan, barely clinging to life. You needed immediate treatment. Which you provided. Yes. He says it so simply, as if I'm a small child he's explaining basic addition to. I frown and flex the fingers on my recently healed arm. Aside from being a little stiff, it feels fine. Thoroughly attached to me. You're saying that you 
stitch my arm back on. Pardon? A solace attacked the caravan. It ripped everyone to shreds. It, it, tore, my, it tore my arm clean off. But when I woke up here, I trail off, bewildered. Never heard of any magic that could heal a mortal wound like that. What kind of person could do such a thing? The doctor, for us, pinches the bridge of his nose. He sits back down in his chair, quiet for a long time. I do not know where you come from, but Iridia is a city of knowledge and deadly secrets alike. Information is power, and it is most unwise to give or receive it freely. Since you have refused to divulge your secrets, I will not divulge mine. I do not even know your name. I was just... You were new to Iridia, so I will overlook this specific breach of etiquette. However, you should not expect others to extend the same courtesy. You understand? He looks pointedly at my freshly bandaged hands. Loath as I am to admit it, he has a point. I'm also a complete stranger to him, and if he's telling the truth, he saved my life. I take a deep, steadying breath. This time, when I speak, I sound a bit more like myself. Shears. My name is Shears. It is a pleasure to meet you, Shears. There's a little more warmth in his smile, his polite demeanor back in an instant. Okay, I am going to save. Cuz. Uh, let's do that. Yeah, I think the reboot was uh, desperately needed on my laptop because now we're like sitting pretty at 74-ish percent. So that's nice. Manners maketh. Manners maketh. Thank you for saving my life. I chance a smile in return. And if you won't explain how he did the impossible, there's no doubt in my mind that I'd be dead if not for Kuras. Think nothing of it. I'm not sure if he's being excessively courteous, but his words have only raised more urgent questions. But I have to ask, why did you save me? You don't know me. The question seems to startle Chorus. I could hardly leave you to die in the waste. Assisting those in need is the very essence of a doctor's duty. Never met a doctor who handed out free clothes. My fingers find the edge of the cloak. There's a subtle but delicately embroidered pattern around the hem. I try not to think about what kind of price Kodos must have might ask for such well-made clothes. No, I suppose not. <sighs> Forgive my presence. I rarely come across so fascinating a patient. I blink. What did he say? I, uh, I simply meant that few would cling to life so resolutely. Or brave such a perilous journey to Iridia. I could not help but be curious about you. His voice dips to a soft murmur, and he abruptly looks away from me. So, as is the tradition for me doing visual novels, I am full thirst ahead, and because we're doing that today, Alert time. I need a drink. <laughs> mm. 
You're pretty curious yourself. Am I? Well, I haven't forgotten about my arm. I wiggle my intact fingers in front of him. Clearly not. You haven't asked me for payment either. I require none from you. Travelers do not have an abundance of coin, and it would be unethical to leave you destitute in a strange place. Yeah, uh, the American healthcare system would have, like to enter the chat for that one. I fall silent, unsure what to say. Nobody would help a horror like me for free. There has to be some kind of catch or trick. Right? A loud knock at the front door stops our conversation cold and spares me from having to say anything else. Judy calls. Unfortunately, you are not my only patient today. The knocking grows more insistent and Coras lets out a fresh tongue. That's out a tired sigh, a fresh sigh. Damn. Please wait your turn. Though he says it quietly, the clamor on the other side of the door abruptly stops. Do you need anything else before you leave, Shears? Oh. Between the soulless attack and mirac miraculous survival, I'd almost forgotten why I came to Iridia in the first place. I need directions to the Cenobium. The Cenobium. The look on his face is downright chilling. He pauses, choosing his words with cold deliberation when he speaks again. Whatever you seek, it is very unlikely you will find it there. The Cenobium's gates open for precious few visitors. Even if they did, you would not like what you found inside. My heart sinks. Is he saying I came all this way for nothing? Risk life and limb? Nothing? No. No, that can't be. I've only just arrived and Iridia is the largest city still standing. There has to be a cure for me here. Okay, then if not the Cenobium, well, where would you suggest? Do you know anyone else in Iridia? I shake my head. Then I suggest a local guide. Head to the wet... Head... Blah! Head to the wet wick and ask for Leander. Excuse... Ex wait, wait, the wet what? The wet wick. He sounds deeply unamused. Follow the postings advertising Leander's bloodhounds. They are difficult to miss. When you meet Leander, tell him I sent you. There isn't much to go on, but Kuras points toward the clinic's back door. You will be safe so long as you do not draw attention to yourself. Easier said than done. I've always been a magnet for the worst sort of attention. If you require my assistance, you may return whenever you wish. Though he's smiling, there's a note of finality in his voice. Resigned to my dismissal, I slip out the back door. I find myself standing in a narrow and rather gloomy alley. I pull the new cloak over my nose stepping over the contents of chamber pots that have been emptied into the street. Something weighs heavily inside one of the cloak's pockets. Coin purse. Everything is still inside. Every last coin I scraped together for the journey to Iridia. It doesn't even look like it was opened. There were so few coins to begin with. They probably weren't worth stealing. I glance back at the clinic's closed door. Chris didn't take any payment. 
He didn't even ask for a future favor. But he also said that in Iridia, secrets are power. Does he expect me to give up mine at some point? Not a, exactly a comforting thought. Still, no matter why he did it, Russ gave me a second chance and a lead where I might find help. Try to get going before he changes his mind. I squeeze out of the alley and into the crowded main street. The line outside Kuros's clinic stretches down the road already. Two thin peddlers queue alongside weathered elders. Any places in desperate need of a free clinic. One. The cobblestones are treacherously rough under my feet. Deep grooves worn between their regular footing and decades of hard use. I knew Iridia was a river city, but I didn't expect it to look so eroded. The buildings are tired and dilapidated, all crammed together in narrow streets. And there's something else. A charge in the air, like shift in pressure before a storm. It's subtle, little more than faint. Persistent thrumming. I can't seem to shake it. A child darts by. Something... Clutching something greasy wrapped in paper. The smell of fried food drifts over to me. My stomach gives a faint gurgle. This morning's catch! Fried up hot and fresh! Not too many eyeballs today! That... That sounds disgusting, but I'm starving, so I duck my head under the stall's grubby awning. A large fish leers up at me, its three eyes bulging still visible through the thick layer of crispy batter. The vendor gives me a gap tooth grin. Uh, what's the cheapest thing you got? The vendor points out a metal basket of what looks like long strips of savory fried dough. Fresh long lads. Three copper a piece. Don't burn your mouth. I take the coins out, counting them gingerly. At this rate, I might not be able to afford dinner. Reluctantly, I drop the payment on the counter and take my meal. Two streets later, I pass under a wrought iron archway adorned with dangling garlands of red and pink lilies. The buildings in this quarter are dizzying, riot of color, painted walls and tinted glass everywhere I look. Sheer red and pink curtains flutter op in open doorways. Music voices call out invitingly. Incense mingles with the pungent smell of flowers, barely covering the salt and musk of warm bodies. Must be Iridia's an entertainment district. I'm polishing off my food and dusting the crumbs from my hands when I spot a poster. It features a silhouette of a smiling man wearing a single dagger-like earring and the word bloodhounds printed above his head. A motto, above and below, circles the artwork. If Leander is the leader of the bloodhounds, then the face on the poster is likely his. I follow the line of identical posters around the corner and nearly hit my head on a precariously dangling wooden sign. Looking up, a faded orange letters read, The Wet Wick. The facade of the building looks like it's seen better days, but I hear faint music and laughter coming from inside. Let me finish that. So... Hmm. 
The inside of the bar is a far cry from the abandoned exterior. It's not even midday, yet most of the tables and booths are occupied by loose assembly of people in matching green cloaks. Bustling bars are not something I'm used to, but I steal myself with a deep breath before pushing forward. A cursory glance doesn't turn up anyone with a dagger-shaped earring. I'm about to head towards the counter when a chant rises from the center of the room. Show! 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 The remaining green cloaks abandon the bar and their booths to rush towards the center of the room in a sudden torrent. There's no time to move out of the way. I'm caught, swept in with the ale stench current. Hey! Rhythmic chanting drowns out my voice. I thrash, throwing out my elbows at the press as oppressive bodies grow heavier. My hip knocks into a table. Oh, I grip it, holding it holding on tightly to steady myself. But the crowd has stilled and the chanting stopped. A pair of gilded boots stride across the de the tabletop. Seriously, you dogs? Again? Scattered laughter and cheers from the audience. I drag my eyes upwards. A well-dressed man stands on the table in front of me, his broad shoulders framed by the thick lapels of a trench coat. This is really the last time, all right? This time when he speaks, the audience falls silent, as though bewitched by his magnetic presence of, or rich, low voice. Yeah, I can't do baritone or bass. I can try, but maintaining that requires me to be down in my chest voice, and that's a little hard for me. But nothing is as captivating as a smile. He beams as the crowd around him, a performer on his makeshift stage. Don't blink, or you'll miss it. He laughs as the dagger-shaped ink earring dangling from his left ear catches the light in a flash of gold. It would seem I found Leander. He raises his hand above the audience and snaps. A flash of pale green light. Real magic. No ordinary stage trick blinds me. As the brilliance ebbs, my gaze refocuses on the mage towering above me. He flicks his wrists and the magic spiraling around him coalesces. A delicate flower stem sprouts from between his pinched fingers. One by one, glowing lily petals spring forth. With a flourish, the mage presents the conjured flowers. The audience bursts into clapping and cheers. Genuine magic show was the last thing I expected in a place called the Wet Wick. Leander plucks the iridescent bouquet out of the air and turns in a slow circle, giving his audience a good look. Now who could use some good luck? Actually, I want to see if... I'm fairly certain that voice volume. There we go. I know this is going to have voice acting, so that's why I'm like trying to keep that up. Eager onlookers scoot closer to this table. Some reach for the lilies while others whistle and call Leander's name. But his cool green eyes slide right over them. Locking onto me instead. How about you? <sighs> My chest tightens. Every person gathered turns to stare at me. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Hold on. Safety save.
We are pro safety saves in this house. Oh. My voice comes out weaker than I'd like. Something someone else might appreciate them more. Leander's smile widens as though he didn't hear me at all. You seem like you could use something to brighten up your day. But as he speaks, the lilies fade away in a shower of opalescent light. To my surprise, Leander laughs under his breath. Problem with flowers. They don't last long, but they leave an impression, right? He grins at me, and I find myself smiling back. Oh, okay. Okay, so, time out. When I did the off stream, I accepted the flowers. I was not sure what would happen. Oh, this is so much better. Ah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I need a drink. Excuse me. Oh my god. This is so cool. Like. Instead of like pleasing people. And this is. Oh. This makes me happy. This definitely makes me happy. Leander steps off the table. Dropping among the excited crowd with an audible clink. All right, bloodhounds, get back to your drinks. Show's over. The green cloaks disperse at his command, returning to their tables and booths. Before I can make my way towards Leander, his eyes find me. He gives me a friendly wave, then beckons me over to the crowded counter. I manage to squeeze beside him. But there's little room that his broad shoulder presses against mine. I tense, but he doesn't seem to mind at all. Is this your first time in Iridia? He says it lightly, with a genuine air of curiosity. Do I stick out that much? No, but I'm certain I'd remember seeing a face as lovely as yours around Lowtown. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, he's smooth. He's very smooth. My goodness. My eyes flicker to the polished countertop. I am not used to flattery and being this close makes eye contact difficult. As if on cue, the bartender approaches us. What can I get you? Surprise me and add anything my friend wants to my tab. I wasn't expecting the generosity, but I have to admit, I do feel a little thirsty after all that fried dough. Okay, so I chose water last time. So let's go with this one. I'll have what he's having. While the bartender leaves to fix our drinks, Leander leans his elbows on the counter. It's close enough to notice the purple shadows under his lower lids. His eyes wander over me in return. But when they lock on my bandaged hands, a sour taste rises in my throat. Here come the questions. So, what brings you to the wick? Kura uh, sent me. He pushes his hair back from his forehead, but immediately falls right back into place. Oh, it's about work. The bartender returns with a pair of glasses filled with what I can only assume is beer. 
I raise my glass and give it an experimental sniff. It smells faintly yeasty, but with an undercurrent I can't quite place. A quick sip confirms my worst suspicions. It's awful. Somehow briny and sour in a way that reminds me of pickles. Ugh. But any thought of complaining dies the moment I look and see Leander taking a deep swig from his glass. He lets out a satisfied breath. Not gonna be a assistance. I need to get to the Cenobium. As soon as the word Cenobium leaves my mouth, the entire bar falls silent. Bloodhounds twist around in their seats to gawk openly. Finally, an especially drunk one speaks up. The hell are you bringing up the Cenobium in here? Bro, mouth! This is Bloodhound territory! The vitriol catches me off guard. From the angry looks thrown my way, it's clear I've broken some unspoken rule just by mentioning the Cenobium. When I glance at Leander, he's drinking as though he hadn't noticed the uproar. Only when he catches me looking does he lower his glass. For the love of... He drags a hand down his face. Hey, keep it down, will you? This is business. I tense, expecting an argument, but the outspoken God damn! The outspoken bloodhounds silently return to their drinks. Only a handful continue to watch me warily. Sorry about them. The Cenobium's a bit of a touchy subject in these parts. Mix enough drinks, and well, you saw. How about we continue this outside? When I give him a terse nod, he pushes away from the bar counter. I follow Leander to an alleyway tucked behind the wet wick, where layers of frayed bloodhound posters have been plastered to the walls. Seeing them side by side, the resemblance between Leander and his likeness on the posters is impressive. Doris didn't send you here for help with the Cenobium, did he? From the look he gives me, he already knows the answer. I glance away. No, he didn't. He suggested I find an alternative. Yet here you are, asking about them anyway. What do you need the Cenobium for? I don't want to tell about my curse. The less people know about my capabilities, the better. Thankfully, Leander takes my reluctant silence as an answer. Um, so you're already aware of this city's currency. Information's worth its weight in gold here. Karasu tells you the truth. The Cenobium's dangerous. Get on their bad side and they'll imprison you if you're lucky, or torture you if you're not. But the Cenobium's supposed to be a place of learning, a sanctuary. The Cenobium has always been heralded as the last bastion of human knowledge, a shining beacon of hope in a world of steeped in nightmares. If any place has the answers, it would be the Cenobium. That's why I came here what they want you to think, but things that seem too good to be true are often just that. Such a simple statement, yet it leaves, it leaves me reeling. If it's true, if I staked everything on a lie, then what now? Leander clears his throat. And as I always say, there are solutions to every problem, and alternatives to every solution. He claps his hands and turns to me with a brilliant smile. That's why Curse pointed you to the bloodhounds. Let us help you. Whether it's hunting Solus, 
finding people or recovering stolen valuables, we can do it all. And free of charge. <sighs> I'm shaking my head before he he's even finished his practice speech. My patience is wearing dangerously thin. Listen, I appreciate the offer, but my problem can't be solved by a group of good Samaritans. To my chagrin, Leander nods softly. Then your problem must be fairly serious, and if the snow beams your, your first choice. You're searching for a magical solution, aren't you? When my eyes widen, he nods along, as though he suspected all along. I'll be happy to help you out. That is, if you tell me what ails you. Leander might not work for the Cenobium. He is a mage. Powerful one at that, if his demonstration earlier is in any indication. In silent, plagued by indec indecision. I don't know if I can trust him, but it's not like I have any alternatives. I hate to admit it, but it could be my only path forward. My confession comes out in a pained whisper. Cursed. Cursed? Oh, now I'm, now I'm very curious. What kind of curse? Something ancestral or more recent? He looks at me up and down, taking in my face, my eyes, and finally my hands. Move the microphone a little closer. Sure. It's your hands, isn't it? I wait until I'm certain my voice will remain steady before answering. <sighs> my touch is dangerous. It, it changes people, hurts them. Before I've been finished, Leander begins taking his glove off. He tugs his left hand free and flexes his fingers. Let's see it. He offers me his hand, and a prismatic flash of magic ripples across his palm. But I'm already shrinking backwards. I can't. I don't know how confident Leander is, but I can't bring myself to hurt him, to see his kind of face twist into a mask of horror. Believe me, this isn't an ordinary curse. I'll be fine. Perhaps where you came from, your affliction was strange and one of a kind. But spend a year in this city, you'll see a thousand curses and thrice as many cures. Do you really think Chorus would send you here if I couldn't handle it? How should I know? I only met him today. I'm as good as any mage in the Synovium. Better even. If they can help, so can I. You don't know what you're asking me. I'm asking you to trust me. Okay. All right, so let's do a save. I'm gonna take a quick break because it is at the two hour mark. Hey, 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 hey. I know. Hi. You need to go outside? Okay. So around here, I strongly encourage folks to take care of themselves however they see fit. Whether it is to get up, stretch, walk around, uh, get some water, get some food, take your medication. Did you take your meds today? Because here's your reminder. And giving your furry, scaly, or feathered friends some scritches in love, however you see fit. Be sure to take care of yourselves, and I will be right back.
All right, welcome on back, everyone. All right, so Lexi has been appeased. She got to go out. I've refreshed on my beverage. <laughs> Hello, uh, Laura Kisil. Please let me know if I'm pronouncing that correctly and what your pronouns are so I can refer to you properly. Fresh star of simp here, just here, just in time to simp Leander. Welcome on in, and it, yeah, uh, Laura's fine, she, her. Okay, great, thank you for letting me know. Um, yeah, we're just up to the part, um, where Leander is just asking us to trust him. And as a full disclosure, I did do a safety run off stream to get all the content warnings and you can touch, uh, type in, uh, t exclamation point, touch CW, uh, into chat for all the content warnings. And always as a reminder for the new folks, please adhere to the house rules and regulations. I do have a permanent no backseating policy. And you can type in exclamation point rules into chat for the house rules and regs. Other than that, let's have some fun and full thirst ahead. <laughs> so let's catch up. I'm asking you to trust me. I look from Leander's outstretched hand to his confident smile. Then with a short breath, I begin unwinding the bandages from my hand. Fine, but if you lose control, don't say I didn't warn you. You can tie me up first if it makes you feel better. With each joint I expose, I grow more and more certain that this is a terrible idea. Ready when you are. If he's bothered by the way my hand looks, he doesn't show it. My fingers hover shakily over his palm. Three, two, one. All right, so in my safety run, I did the bottom. I did not do this one. So we are going to scum save. And come back to that. I hesitate at the last second, but Leander does not. His hand closes tightly around mine. The instant his fingers graze mine, his expression goes blank. Leander? I try to pull away, but he won't let go. My stomach sinks, fear clutching me even harder than Leander's grip as he takes a slow, deliberate step closer. Free hand rises, outstretched fingers angling towards my neck. No, you're just fine. What the fuck? the shit out of me oh man what interesting that's one hell of a curse yeah that got me too they did that on purpose Oh my god. This is a horror game. This is a horror game. 
first and foremost. Well done. His hands lay. He lands. His hand lands gently on my shoulder to steady me. I didn't even realize I was shaking. I searched for Leander's face for traces of horror, but his eyes remain a clear, soft green. Color rises in his cheeks, but he remains still except for the subtle bobbing of his throat. Neither of us speak as I trace the contours of Leander's palm. Lost in an awareness I wasn't prepared for. I've been with other people, kissed them, been embraced by them, and more, but not like this. My fingers, long deprived by years of bandaging, pick up every single detail. The grooves of his palm, smooth shell of his nails, the pulse of his heart. Have you ever tried Blooming Panic, by the way? Highly recommend if you like dating sims. I have not heard of that, but I will definitely uh, look into it. For as long as I've lived, I've never been able to hold someone's hand. Not without dire consequences. I never realized what I was doing until this moment. While Leander's pulse is steady, mine is hammering as fear gives way to excitement. Okay. My hand glides over Leander's wrists and up his forearm, where smooth skin abruptly gives way to the ray scar by the edge of his sleeve. It matches the one that runs from his collar to his cheekbone. Could it be the same wound? I glance at Leander's face, and his lips part as he considers his words before speaking. Am I the first person you've been able to touch like this? My hand goes still on his arm. So far. I'll admit your touch does make it somewhat difficult to stay level-headed, but not due to your power. He takes my hand. His soft green eyes flick to mine before he turns it into inspect the golden fissures crisscrossing my knuckles. Look. We match. He points to the golden pin on his coat collar, and I give him a soft smile. I draw my hands back and take a steadying breath. My head feels as if, as though I'm stuffed with cotton. Habit alone guides me through the motions of rewrapping my hand, although my, fa my fingers tremble too much for the bandages to lie flat. Oh, shit. I need this game to have a harem rune. You know, I was actually talking about like how uh, when I played When the Night Comes, there were two options for uh, polyamorous romance. I think that's pretty cool. I don't know if they're going to go down that route with this one, but we'll see. And considering that this is still the demo, I don't know when uh, the full game is coming out since it's still under development. I can't believe that worked. Can I ask your name? Uh, I'm Shears. You were right to hide this from me, Shears. That curse of yours, it's Unlike anything I've ever dealt with. I can tell you're discreet. But you best not go showing off that to anyone else. 
estimate was fourth quarter 2025. The wait is going to give me brain rot. Ah, I know, like, I know a lot of folks who are very hyped for this game. I would rather wait and play every little bit of options that are in this game, or at least in the demo, is I have been forged in the fires of Final Fantasy and Dragon Age. I know what it is to wait many years for a good game, and I think it'll be worth it. <laughs> uh, I didn't plan on it. Are you staying in Lowtown? I pause. Room and board was something I hadn't yet considered. I don't know. Let's get you properly settled then. The wet wick is noticeably quieter. Without their leader, most of the bloodhounds have dispersed, or in a few cases, fallen asleep beside their drinks. Got any rooms left, or did my lot grab them all and sleep it off? The bartender, who I now realize is doubles as the innkeeper, slides a key onto the counter. Now I always keep the counter room, the corner room open for your escapades. Anders' laugh sounds slightly strained. <laughs> and I always appreciate it, but you're mistaken. This is just for my friend Shears. Uh, sure. Stay as long as you like. You two have fun. Escapades? Leander closes his, clears his throat and holds the key out to me. But I hesitate. My coin purse barely holds enough for a day's worth of meals, let alone a room. How much do I owe you? Nothing. Bloodhound rates. <sighs> My treat since you shared your secret. Food, drink, warm bed, anything you need. Carefully, I take the key from him. It's small, but waves heavily into my palm. Never had expected to have a warm bed in Iridia, let alone free meals. Thank you. Go explore, Shears. You'll find many roads in Iridia, each leading to different answers. But if you need a reprieve from what haunts you, come find me. Just be careful. I nod, taking one last look at the gleaming bronze key before tucking it into the pocket of my cloak for safekeeping. Leander gives me one last friendly wave before I depart. The air clings, sodden and heavy. Without the morning crowd, the sunless streets look barren and bleak. Even the peddlers are long gone. Only a pair of crows remain quibbling over stale crusts in a gutter. I feel a ridiculous pang of envy. You see, I've got a reason to fight. Never felt so lost. Chorus and Leander both made it clear that the Cenobium can't be trusted. But I came so far and endured so much. I need to see the Cenobium for myself, if only to satisfy my curiosity. I should have asked someone at the bar for directions before leaving. I'm about to turn back when a shadow passes over me. A cloud, I think. Until I'll have... Puff of hot breath tickles the back of my neck. The shadow runs down the streets in rivets. Formless dark spreads like ink bottled into bottled shapes. Claws stretch. A muzzle splits open to reveal long, jagged teeth. A growl rumbles so low and deep I can feel it. I want to run, scream. But I feel trapped, as though the slightest movement of a single breath will snap the jaws around me shut. 
no, I won't let it end like this. I'm going to die. I want to see what got me first. I seal myself and turn. The shadows vanish as quickly as they came. I'm left standing in the middle of the street, alone except for a figure reclining in the shade of a nearby stoop. A monster. That much is clear at a glance. One that can only be mistaken for human were it not for the tufted ears, the tail curled around his ankle. Or the dusk pink eyes with pupils that sharpen like needles when they fall on me. Our eyes meet and the monster uncrosses his long legs. His hair gleams a shade of red that reminds me unsettlingly of blood where it curls around his collared throat. Jumpy, are you? His tone is so light and carefree that I glance over my shoulder to make sure he's speaking to me. When I look back, the stranger props his chin on his knuckles and regards me with an inscrutable little smile. I thought Veer was going to be my favorite, but then I played the demo and Ace and Leander, best boys. Hey, everybody's got their favorites. Didn't, didn't you see the shadow that just passed? That it was massive and moved like a beast. Even as I speak, I'm aware how ridiculous that must sound. But the stranger's smile doesn't falter. The only beasts I've seen are the Wicks drooling resin regulars, though... This did catch my eye. With a flourish of his hand, my in-room key appears dangling from his finger. It turns on its chain, glittering when it catches the light. My hand flies to my cloak's pockets and, sure enough, find them flat. He crooks his finger, beckoning. I've already taken two steps forward before some stifle instinct stops me. Something feels wrong. I'm still on the edge, thrumming with so much adrenaline that the sh uh, stranger's shadow flickers at the edges of my vision. I always get, attract the worst kind of attention. I can't get rattled now. Okay. So we're going to... Save. So, last on the safety run, I chose this. Let's see what happens. How did you even find it? The key, I mean. What can I say? I'm a sucker for shiny things. He smiled. Was wide enough to reveal his pointed canines. So you drop it. You really should be more careful. If he's like this, somebody might take advantage. Bald faced lie without any hint of irony. There's no way I dropped that key. But I can't think of an explanation for how it went from my pocket to his hand. I approach the man. Careful to keep it arm's length away. He doesn't look dangerous, but most deadly ones never do. The stranger's chain softly clinks with the tilt of his head. His ears flick. Keeping your distance? I'd be reckless to trust you. You think I stole your dinky little key? From all... The way over there. He gives an exaggerated sigh. <sighs> I'm good with my hands. Not that good. Do I really look like a common thief to you? I 
I'm not sure. Eh. That's fair. But do remember, when we thirst in on this uh, express train, we do so respectfully. And remember, if you're feeling thirsty, hydrate. Skomer there. The sheer fabric of his sleeves alone would be too expensive for the most for most street thieves. Hell, his shoes look like they could cost more than I spent traveling here. And then there is the shop behind him. No matter the city, the parted pink curtains can only ever mean one thing. I'm not looking to buy, and I doubt I could afford your services anyway. Lucky for you, I don't charge. The man runs a tip of his tongue over a fang, and for the first time since I stepped into that shadow, I feel something other than dread. My face grows hot. Um, that, okay, uh, that's not what I meant. I'm flattered, really. Where sex my trade, I might have Make an exception for you. How about half off for a- oh, nope. Or you can just hand over my key! Exactly. Ask nicely. And I might even let you tug my tail. Just- just throw it here. So some spindy little street urchin can snatch it and run. He raises my key and tilts his head so he can watch it dangle back and forth. I suppose I could just claim your room for myself. Not that I'd be caught dead slumming in the wick with the rest of those slack-jawed assholes. You're obviously not, not from around here. So tell me, stranger. What misfortune brought you to this wretched place? His voice practically drips with derision. I'm not telling you anything. What could possibly... What could have possibly drawn you to this dreary little pig pen? I wonder. He listlessly watches the arc of my key swinging from his finger. Well, there's shit. Food's dreck. And there's entirely too many monsters for a human to feel safe. Unless... Dagger-sharp eyes flicker toward me. They gleam with amusement. Unless you're just dying to consort with monsters. By now, my embarrassment has worn away, leaving simmering impatience in its place. If this is a shakedown, it's the most frustrating one I've ever heard of. Now, do remember, I have done the turndown. We fight fire with fire. Yes, does it burn? Does it burn us? Yes, but we are going to have some fun. How'd you know that I spent all my money? Starved and nearly died in a swamp just so I could crawl into the bed for the first thirsty monster I saw. That earns me a burst of breathy laughter. He gazes at me under his dark lashes. <laughs> oh, aren't you funny? Could you be any more obvious? I've been told subtlety is not my strength. Oh. Your place or mine? Alright, we are going for full chaos. Clear the closing doors. Full thirst ahead.
If only I had my key then. I might be able to invite you up. His languid gaze glides from me to the key in his hand and back. Come. Take my hand and we'll go together. The more he flirts, the more convinced I become that this was some kind of trap. <laughs> Dude, me, we're going to be respectfully thirsty, Veer. Well, I'm not. <laughs> Look, if you're going to tango, we're going to do this. Like, wait, what was that point? Oh, that was just a bird. Um, it takes two to tango, so let's do this. So, no matter how innocent monsters look, they always have tricks up their sleeves. And something tells me that this one's more dangerous than he lets on. Even if he has a lovely laugh. I don't know what you want or why you're messing with me. I'm not coming any closer until I know you aren't going to attack. Or bite. I don't want to fight hard. Unless you beg me. Oh my god. <laughs> Ooh. Oof. It is warm. I need a drink. Ah. This is your this is the reminder to make sure that you are also hydrated. A hydrated oh wow, words. What are words? <laughs> So no matter what I say, he finds a way to twist my words in, into innuendo. I do need to update the content warning for that. Even when I'm silent, he goes on as though we're having a conversation, not a standoff. You like dancing? There's a traveling troupe performing in Hightown tonight. Their loot is utterly exquisite. Really a performance to die for. There's life in this dreadful place, if you know where to look. You sound like you know the city well. The man's gaze flickers from me to the key dangling from his finger. Naturally. Stump was little more than a miserable little smear when I first arrived. I town, no town. No, already on like a bag in my hand. What about the Cenobium? You know where that is? His smile vanishes. Really, you've seen it. That absurdly large tower looming over the rest? A little hard to miss. He must mean the spire I noticed when I first caught sight of Iridia. <sighs> Cenobium's overrated. Forget about it. I can show you things those stumpy fours in their limpic tower couldn't ever dream of. I've already got plans. Oh? Pressing matters at the Cenobium. Lunch date with librarians. Tea time with the most esteemed abbess. That's my business. What's it matter to you? I square my shoulder, and the amusement bleeds out of him. Your loss. The stranger, finally bored of this tedious game, extends his hand towards me. The key rests on his palm, neatly dividing skin and leather. When he makes no move, I reach for the key. But as soon as my fingers graze smooth brass, his hand springs shut around my elbow. Hey! He yanks me down as I, and I stagger, my soul slipping on the steps. 
for a sick moment, I fear my bandages will unravel under his touch. But he's careful not to disturb them, even as his fingers dig into my arm. I knew I smelled blood. You reek of death and the road. And that fucking doctor. His voice, once silken, lowers to a smoky growl. The shadows around him seethe and boil as he pulls me closer. And something else. He murmurs against my throat, nose grazing my jaw. Let, look, let go. I try to twist away, but he doesn't budge. His breath trails down my neck sending a thrill of dread through me. But just when I fear he bite, he takes a deep whiff instead. His wide, flat eyes gleam with naked hunger as he gazes up at me. <sighs> Not quite human. Not quite monster. Seems we're both. Veer! The stranger's ears flatten, and he releases me with a short breath. I yank my arm back, massaging where his grip left grooves in the bandages. The stranger twists around to watch a woman to duck out of the curtains behind him. Her press uniform marks her a cleric of the Cenobium. I leave you for all of what? I leave you for all of what? Ten minutes, and you're making trouble again. Will you quit harassing the tourists? The stranger, Veer, I take it, rolls his eyes and flashes the cleric a withering smile. So suspicious. Can't you see this is a friend of mine? A natural liar. He grins at me and his tail swishes minutely. The woman purses her lips at me, clearly unconvinced. I open my mouth to correct him, but Veer cuts in. I was graciously offering my dear friend some free advice. Through his voice, though his voice remains light and cheerful, his expression darkens. Danger's drawn to you like a moth to a flame. I will always give, find you given time. The woman clucks her tongue as though she's heard this recital one two, 102 times. <sighs> Word of advice. Don't take it free advice from lazy foxes lounging on the streets. Crook will sell water to a drowning man for the sheer enjoyment of it. She shrugs off the a wilting look from Veer. Oh, please. Any friend of yours knows it's true. Now hold still. Veer rises gracefully at her approach. He pushes his hair aside so it drapes over one shoulder, exposing the long line of his neck. And suddenly it dawns on me that the jingling I heard earlier wasn't coming from the harness attached to the collar. But a leash. A heavy iron chain wound around a hitching post and padlocked to the back of a collar. Veer posed deliberately to hide his leash from me. The woman produces a key ring from her pocket. She rifles through a dozen identical keys before selecting one and slotting it into the lock. Come on, unless your friend's tagging along on our merry little solace hunt. They're hunting for Solus inside the city? Words momentarily fail me. Uh, the woman regards me with a polite, if tight, smile before marching down the stairs. Veer lingers. He stretches his arms over head with a yawn. And I try not to stare at the way his stomach flattens when he arches his back. 
Your little secret safe with me. Try not to get yourself killed. Hmm? Veer hops off the stoop and bounds after the woman. His tail sways merrily, as though he hadn't just lied and threatened me. Did you try the thing I had mentioned? The Lefethian knot? That one where you take your three fingers and actually, don't tell me. Knowing you, it's disgusting. Veer's airy laughter echoes down the street. It's only after he and the cleric vanished from sight that I realize I'm still missing something. Wait! Reflexively, I shove my hands in the pocket and I find it. The room key. I pull it out of my pocket and raise it to the light just to be sure. A nagging feeling distracts from my relief. I don't know what Veer's game was or what he wanted from me. All I know is for certain that the Cenobium saw fit to leash him. Fate I could share, if that's what his vague warning meant. I lift my eyes skyward past the lanterns gently swaying in the breeze, the Cenobium faintly through uh, the haze. One glance, is, one glimpse is all I need. And I can put this behind me. This time, the key goes into my purse for safekeeping. And that is where I'm going to save. And I've been doing, I've been at this since 1.30. I saved, so we're okay. All right, so I technically, technically have been at this. Oh, you son of a bitch. I've been at this for about uh, three hours or two, three hours now. Stand by. My OBS is being a butt. Let's see. So I'm actually going to see who we can raid. I definitely want to do this again. I really like the game. It's a lot of fun. And I'm enjoying it. I, I definitely want to finish the demo and maybe play a few other options off stream. But I am looking forward to seeing like when this comes out. So let me see who is on. Let me just refresh my feed. Let's see, who have I not? Uh... Let's go. Okay, so Stephen Joyce is on and currently playing finding hannah so stephen joy's pronouns he him he is a very sweet person good quality people i highly recommend so we're gonna go see if we can raid stephen and if not i have backups All right, everybody, here is the raid call. Please feel free to put whatever heart emotes you like in front of it. And remember the raid rules. When we go over there, you're going to listen to the mods and streamer. Be in your best behavior because it is a reflection of the love, music, and appreciation I bring over to Steven's community. I will be back on Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Daylight Time, over on Girls Run These Worlds channel for as we run through the Rotten Wonderlands for the final episode. I finally caught up uh, on the VOD, so I found out some things, and I cannot wait to cause some chaos over there. And then on Saturday, I will be uh, continuing to do some sewing and some modifications of the Sophie dress, and maybe starting a new game. Who knows? Um, all goes well with OBS? We'll find out. But 
thank you all so much for coming by. If you want to follow me on social media, here is where you can find me. And if you are in the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and certain areas of Pennsylvania, and you need a photographer, hit me up. I'm the, I run different drum photography. I'm very good at what I do. Hire me. And so I got to get going. So remember, hey, you're doing good. Don't worry about it. I'll go make some noise for Steven.